All right, thank you. So I missed uh, all the fun of yesterday, uh, but hopefully some of the points that have been made yesterday I, I will repeat or emphasize. Uh, with a title like this, um, I felt I should place myself in a box uh, or, or play a certain role. And so I've added a disclaimer, a few comments from a sarcastic computational chemist, because I'll be talking about issues. Um, my field historically has been known as quantitative structure activity relationship modeling, where uh, people for years have been fascinated by our ability to predict complex in vivo effects of molecules directly from their chemical structure. And, uh, and this fascination uh, led to a lot of concentration on how to develop models. Um, but this issue of, of dependency and um, of modeling results and um, data quality and critical issues, people started addressing about six or seven or eight years ago. And the first paper that at least caught my attention, because prior to this we've been focusing on how to build models, talked about how uh, impossible it is to um, believe data on um, the types of targets on the function of biological targets that are published in, uh, in the open literature. And the paper from BSF was talking about, um, about inability of scientists in, um, in one particular company to reproduce claims in the literature. Ironically, the same week, it was a paper by my colleagues in chem informatics talking about uh, how poor data um, is in uh, chemical data sets and how inaccurate chemical structures are in the data sets. And then, um, and then it was another paper published earlier uh, asking a simple question, are chemical structures in your model correct? Showing that even a small fraction of incorrect structures leads to eight to 10% leads to dramatically reduced or dramatically altered results of the modeling. And this whole um, um, direction of looking at the quality of data and the influence of data quality on the models had continued with more and more papers uh, showing up. So um, the same colleagues of mine uh, later published a paper um, looking at the comparison of results on the same chemicals generated uh, with identical high throughput screening technology and the only difference was the type of tips that automatic pipettes used, and they showed that the results was, were different, different and uh, the results of modeling and what models suggested as the next chemicals to synthesize were different. And this is the issues that are very hard to capture uh, and, and uh, if you're focusing uh, simply on modeling. And, and this, this has continued. So um, here is another uh, paper uh, with, with the following statement found in the supplemental information. That's of course, peer reviewed in the American Chemical Society. Emma, please insert an amount of data here. Where are they? And for this compound, just make up an elemental analysis. And again, we depend on these types of uh, data, and we, we need to analyze, uh, et cetera. And so uh, there is no doubt that when these types of papers have been published, increasingly, NIH started paying attention. And there were papers that uh, I'm, I'm, I imagine most of you have seen uh, coming from Francis Collins about NH plans to enhance reproducibility, um, et cetera. And so uh, that was five years ago. Uh, and, and of course, a few years later, the world had become fascinated with, with AI and new algorithms to the point that uh, people started saying about how forgiven AI techniques to the quality of data. And I've seen uh, talks titled uh, AI methods of dirty data, great AI methods could deal with that. Uh, and, and one example of uh, this sort of attitude spilling over to uh, toxicity prediction, which is uh, to some extent a, a topic for this workshop, um, uh, is a paper that caught our attention last year uh, that claimed that uh, big data techniques uh, can lead to models that outperform animal test reproducibility. I was not here yesterday, unfortunately, when Thomas was giving the presentation. But we've looked at this paper. Uh, the claims were very, very high. The methods were very, very interesting. And uh, a lot of hype has been generated um, uh, with, uh, with this paper and these types of approaches. And I'm just uh, showing a few of those. And that reminded me of this fa initial fascination with QS AR, much sim simpler techniques. And then, and then all of a sudden, people started talking about the data quality and how that affects the results. And so that continued. Uh, the hype continued, and uh, 
Now, the life has become very simple, and that is that anybody with 300 bucks uh, could get a prediction uh, of one compound for one endpoint um, using software that, that was advertised. Now, um, I mentioned that I put myself into this box of a sarcastic model, and so that's how we read every paper. And, and when we started looking at the results presented in this particular study, and it's not unique, it's just one example of, of, uh, um, of a narcissism uh, on the part of people uh, playing with AI tools, because it's really, really engaging. Uh, the only comment that we had in the end uh, that gave uh, a title to um, the paper with the shortest title ever published was Oy Vey. And uh, that was an internal joke, really, but uh, the journal took it, and, and we have published this paper, <laughs> indeed, as, as a commentary to, uh, to this early publication. And what we found uh, there uh, was multiple um, errors uh, that, um, as we saw it, uh, were associated with how data was processed in this publication. Um, one of which was uh, that, that the, the underlying data set was coming from ECHA, which is a regulatory agency in Europe. And um, a lot of data uh, that were collected were actually predicted, but used as if they were collected experimentally. It was just one issue. And then there were other issues, inadequate data, replication of compounds and data set. I, I will show some results of redoing this analysis in a few minutes. And then misuse, misinterpretation of statistics or efficient of data, et cetera, failure to validate models correctly. So um, we've explained all these issues. And uh, what followed was a response. And, and uh, the response was, was pretty much fascinating, uh, which, which was that, that our letter was challenging the approach as one would challenge a traditional QSR. And that models published in this paper are not traditional QSR where in a highly curated small training data set is used to predict a single property based on chemical descriptors. We're not doing QSAR, we're doing AI. That pretty much was, was the, the summary. And I had difficulty accepting the fact that someone is taking chemical structures, calculating chemical descriptors, making predictions with whatever method, and then it's not a QSAR. Um, and so, um, I mentioned that, uh, and, and my talk is about issues, I mentioned that uh, this is just one isolated case, but it's very representative of, of many cases. And apparently, if you look for literature that is not glorifying AI, but looks at issues associated with, uh, with AI, uh, you find titles like this. And apparently, it was a workshop uh, earlier this year here on machine learning causing science crisis. And the points that were made by one of the scientists making the presentation there, Dr. Allen from Rice University, uh, that I found pretty appealing, were that uh, we analyze data that produce results that are misleading and often completely wrong. Uh, and one of the reasons is that the algorithms that we use have been developed specifically to find interesting things in data sets. So when they search through huge amounts of data, they will inevitably find a pattern. And that's similar to me specifically looking for papers that criticize AI as opposed to papers that glorify AI, right? So that's one example of this. Um, and there's general recognition of reproducibility crisis in science. And that's, remember, I've started by saying that people doing traditional QSR at some point had realized that there is a reproducibility crisis. So we basically come the whole circle. And uh, the point, uh, one of the major points of my presentation is that regardless of the methods that we use, we really should be paying attention to the same issues that historically had plucked models developed with much simpler techniques. And so um, uh, the reason I think that we might be experiencing this crisis, and one of the issues is that we tend to focus what is new, novel, and exciting. And no doubt it is exciting to be able to process huge data sets. And that's the biggest advantage of uh, deep learning and newest methods is that for the first part, we have enough data that allow us to use these methods and, and basically uh, develop statistically significant models. But what we tend to forget is that before uh, we happen to deal with this um, data sets uh, and structured data that enable data analytics, this data come from somewhere. And these days, the data come from everywhere, including even unstructured text and social media, et cetera, which is a very interesting way of extracting and analyzing data. And before this data uh, can be analyzed, 
they have to be consolidated in what's called in data science a data lake, curated, integrated, and structured, and that uh, later on enables model development and then application of those models to guide experimental design or um, in regulatory agencies to guide decision support. And without paying attention to the quality of data and properly processing the data, the experimental design and ultimately generation of new data guided by models uh, becomes uh, probably a nonsensical uh, exercise. And, and what we need to remember uh, is that data reproducibility and data curation are critical. Otherwise, we tend to say BD2K as big data to knowledge. It becomes bogus data to nonsense. And you might notice that this, this paper is, is uh, this word is misplaced, uh, or, or, or it's a typo. Well, first of all, I am a foreigner, so I'm allowed to make typos, especially these days. Uh, but really, the point here is that if you don't know how to curate your data, then you don't know how to speak um, the language. Uh, just to give you a few examples of what we deal with, historically, have dealt with, uh, in QSR modeling. So we, we take data sets and we correlate biological activities with chemical structures. Uh, structures that I show here are coming from realistic data sets. And at some point, we've looked and analyzed and cataloged the types of errors that can be found in data sets. And with bigger data sets, there is bigger fraction of compounds with errors, and it makes it more and more difficult to process this data set. So we need automated techniques that uh, can deal with huge data. And this is just a few examples that question our ability, uh, I won't go into detail that was published, uh, our ability to build QSR models. And, and, and I would say that, that uh, in modern days, with poor data, AI methods could process them, but it's the difference between ability uh, and capability, right? And, 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 and it's important to realize that the models that we develop today have to be robust, and I think it was um, a lot said about it in the previous talk. Uh, so, so as I mentioned, uh, uh, we have published guidance and uh, specific recommendations and steps to go through as, as uh, one curates chemical data sets, talking about both chemical structures and biological activities, and similar workflows uh, need to be developed for any type of data, because the more I read about applications of AI across the board, uh, healthcare, uh, economy, politics, etc. We deal with incorrect data, and we need to correct data and, and curate uh, and, and use protocols specific to, to every field. Uh, the point I'm making now is that AI does not cancel um, any rules of statistical data modeling, and um, I was thinking about what, what what what's happening. And imagine that you're stopped on the highway. And you're basically saying, officer, uh, I was driving 125 miles an hour, and I've stopped everybody who was driving 85. So the rules are not applicable to me. It's, a, it's a pretty much the same uh, what, what's happening with, um, with the use of AI. And, and they're given basic principles of data analytics. And so one of the best papers, in my opinion, that was published in, in the QSR field, and that will allow me to talk about um, issues related to statistical aspects of modeling, uh, was titled, How Not to do QSR, and I think such papers or such studies need to be published in every area of application of, um, of modern methods. And specifically, it's a long list. Um, I want to focus on lack of, of or inadequate statistics and mis misuse and misinterpretation of statistics, and there is enough said about this in the literature um, uh, these days. Uh, but, but the other issue besides data quality is, is our fascination with methods to the point of overselling, and I understand it was discussed recently as well. And so uh, when, 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 of course, when this method started, everybody got excited, and people started, including our group, uh, started publishing statements that uh, these types of methods outperform traditional, much simpler, much less, therefore, interesting <laughs> approaches. Uh, at the same time, they were, and I'm now talking about deeper aspects of statistical modeling than just superficial kind of look at, at the data quality. Uh, some people have been saying at the same time that you don't always have deep improvement. And one example that I want to share with you um, is a paper that was published uh, in the QSR field by one of the key people in using deep learning networks um, across the board to turn to a sub writer who turned his attention to um, uh, QSAR. 
And the statement that was made on the paper was this. We found the deep learning methods significantly outperform all competing methods. Now, the question is what the word significant means and how we should take this word. Some journals force you to remove this word. Nature science specifically does not let you use this word in a colloquial sense, right? Because it really has to be justified. When you look deeply at this publication, this is the best result published. This is old, boring SVM. This is new, exciting feature neural net. The difference is that the largest performance difference between DNN and SVM or random forest using the same descriptors was 0 0.04. Mine, this, that's a standard error, is an order of magnitude larger, 0 0.12. And so uh, that's another aspect. There is nothing wrong with using these methods, but I think it's very wrong to oversell uh, the advantages that these methods provide uh, over existing techniques. And again, we have to be very careful analyzing results at this level. Uh, a few points on, on what needs to be done and has to be done. Uh, um, we have developed best practices for QSR modeling. Um, I want to see papers with the title best practices published across the board for any application of, uh, of modeling. Uh, what we emphasized there was the importance of using an external set and providing statistics and model accuracy prediction, focusing on an external set, and eventually the best computational uh, validity that one could uh, use to prove that the model works is experimental confirmation which uh, is easier to do in chemical fields, uh, but probably possible to do in other fields as well. Um, just to finish, a couple of stories that um, specific data, specific modeling exercises that um, um, we have done following uh, what we call best practices. Um, one is back to the same data set, a similar data set that I started with, which is uh, a regulatory so-called six packs better if acute toxicity tests that are, that are shown here. Now, I don't need to emphasize uh, why it's important to develop models. So um, if you follow protocols for data retrieval, data curation, integration, statistical modeling, external validity, et cetera, and as a disclosure, uh, we just uh, formed a company called Predictive LLC that intends to uh, um, distribute these models. Uh, if, you, if, if you follow all these routines, the first thing that happens is that the number of data that goes into the model is reduced dramatically. And what I show here is a data set similar to the one I've mentioned in the beginning when I criticized one of the papers, and just look at how dramatically the amount of data changes from 10,000 for one of the points to 1,000. And that is done as a result of removing inconsistent data which are abundant in the data sets, mixtures, et cetera, so some chemistry-specific as well as non-specific aspects of the data. And that's the effect of data cleaning. What is the other effect of data cleaning? Um, it's the, uh, the model accuracy. And the model accuracy is appreciable, but not, not incredibly super high. And uh, it's not as high uh, as, as models that have been um, uh, reported um, in, in, uh, in the publication uh, that was discussed yesterday. I'm trying to go back. Yes. So it's not as high, uh, but it's a realistic modeling result. And the question is whether you want models with high accuracy, whether you want models with realistic accuracy. And paying attention to data quality and paying attention to uh, the rigor of modeling gives models that I would regard as honest, um, rather than um, exciting. Um, the last piece, which is somewhat unrelated, but what fascinates uh, my and other groups these days, which is an interesting use of big data, is looking at uh, the connectivities between information and knowledge sources and, and, and data in various knowledge sources across the board. We are all interested in bringing together disparate data from different sources to analyze, uh, for instance, biological pathways or adverse outcomes pathways or clinical outcome pathways. And the ongoing effort uh, in my group in collaboration with uh, scientists at uh, UNC, at the Renaissance Computing Institute, and with NIHS, uh, for instance, is, is um, building what's known as knowledge graphs, integrating millions of disparate data uh, in um, 
literature sources in uh, chemical, biological, et cetera, databases into what's known as, as knowledge graph. Uh, and uh, what was shown here is the ontology applicable to biological pathways. And behind each of those ontological terms, there are specific data that relate to the ontological concepts. And the way um, this can be applied and we're begin, beginning to apply is uh, to answer questions that come from observational real world data in a mechanistically sound way. And one specific ongoing example that's collaboration with Charles Schmidt, who is, who is in, in the room, is that um, from, from surveys, uh, it has been observed that degreasers may cause colitis. And that came just from, from real world observations. So the question is, is there a mechanistic link between this real world data? Is this a random observation? And can uh, we answer a, quest, uh, a question about uh, any uh, plausibility of this connection. Now, first we need to know is what the degrees of, uh, are, and, and that they are chemicals. And second, we need to know what is known in the world of knowledge across the board about how these chemicals affect uh, biological systems. And so by looking at the knowledge graph, we could deduce uh, genes that these chemicals affect, biological processes that these chemicals affect, and eventually get to the point of um, uh, damages that is done as a result of exposure to these chemicals in epithelium tissue that may lead to colitis. And that's just an example of uh, using big data in a way of deducing knowledge uh, with the, before we get to, to, to any modeling exercises. So um, I'll skip that. So, so just to summarize, uh, we do deal with accumulation of big data and the models that we could create today can have uh, pretty rigorous statistics because of the amount of data that we have and the ratio between the amount of observations and tunable parameters and neural nets. So it is great that we could do this. However, primary data must be handled with extreme care and curation and validation of the data is a must. Uh, on the plausible side, we observe growing use of models to guide experimental uh, research. And it is important, nevertheless, that the models have to be rigorously and comprehensively validated using truly external data. And um, somewhat specific to, uh, to my field, there is a critical shift from discovery to design and, and AI-driven robotics, and that's the plausible applications of AI, um, at, at least in the area of, of, of chemical and chemical toxicology. So with that, let me finish, and, and thank you for your attention.